Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your word. We pray that by learning about what Christians have confessed in the past and what our church officially subscribes to, that our strength be faith, our faith be strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we talked last week about the Augsburg Confession. We've got several people who weren't here last week, so I'll go uh, very quickly over what we talked about last week, which was that, you know, uh, Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses in 1517 and 1521. He was excommunicated. And in 1530, there was an imperial diet, a meeting of the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically would become 400 years later Germany. Um, and uh, the emperor, who was uh, Roman Catholic, asked for a confession of faith from the evangelical churches, and they handed over to him this confession of faith. This, this meeting took place in the Bavarian city of Augsburg, and so this confession of faith became known as the Augsburg uh, conf Confession. And um, we... we we started reading what that confession of faith actually said last week. Uh, Article 1 was about God. It reaffirmed uh, that the evangelicals were not doing anything new. They were confessing faith in the Trinity, just like the early church had. They were confessing faith that uh, Christ is fully God and fully man. Uh, Article 2, uh, affirming the belief in original sin, that sin is is more than a mistake I make or my wrong action. Uh, it's something more than that. Um, article three then is actually, I, I conflated article one and article three. Article three is about how Jesus is truly divine and truly human. And then we got to article four, which is what the big controversy was about in 1530. Um, and so uh, let's take a look at that one one more time before we then go on. Uh, Article 4, which has been labeled concerning justification, it's in brackets like that because there, were, there weren't titles for these articles in 1530. Those were la added later, but they're universally used. Furthermore, it is taught that we cannot obtain forgiveness of sin, righteousness before God through our merit, work, or satisfactions, but that we may receive forgiveness of sin and become righteous before God out of grace for Christ's sake through faith. When we believe that Christ has suffered for us and that for his sake our sin is forgiven and righteousness and eternal life are given to us, for God will regard and reckon faith, this faith as righteousness in his sight, as St. Paul says in Romans 3 and 4. So this is kind of the, the, uh, the breaking through of, of Paul's teaching especially in the book of Romans that has kind of started this reformation, started this controversy in Western Christendom. And um, it's just basically saying that when it comes to justification, when it comes to how God makes us right with him, how God makes us righteous before his divine judgment seat, it's all a gift of God. It's what God does through Christ. Uh, grace, uh, God's favor for us. Uh, he, he, he does this uh, by faith. What do you do when God says to you, I forgive you your sins? But there's nothing, there, there's plenty of things to do later, but there's nothing to do with that word other than trust it, actually believe what it says. Because, of course, to us, it often feels like we're not forgiven. It often feels like we're not on our way to resurrection and eternal joy. And so faith is, is trusting the word, and that alone is righteousness. Uh, not any merits, works, or satisfactions uh, of of our own uh, make God well pleased with us. So that's the that's the key article in the Augsburg Confession is the fourth article. Uh, but already before the Augsburg Confession was given in 1530, uh, controversies had broken out among the people that would come to be called Protestants. And so really to this day for, for almost 500, well, four or 500 years now, uh, Protestants have been uh, arguing with each other about what faith exactly is and uh, how faith is made. 
So now these next several articles of the Augsburg Confession will uh, sort of clarify um, what is being said in Article 4. Okay, so stop me as, as you have questions here as we go through this. Um, and uh, well, let's just take Article, Article 5, uh, which has been labeled concerning the office of preaching. To obtain such faith, so of course this is saying we're referring back to the fourth article. This is the, the, the faith in Christ that God counts as righteousness. To obtain such faith, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and the sacraments. Through these, as through means, he gives the Holy Spirit who produces faith where and when he wills in those who hear the gospel. So remember, this is 1530. This is one year after the small catechism has been written, in which uh, Martin Luther talks in the third article, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and the catechism asks, what does this mean? And the beginning of the answer is, I believe I cannot by my own understanding or effort come to Jesus Christ my Lord or believe in him. But the Holy Spirit has called me through the gospel, and it goes on from there. So uh, this is saying the same thing, is that um, God, the, the, the Holy Spirit makes faith. Faith comes from the Holy Spirit, uh, not from us. Uh, how does the Holy Spirit make faith? Well, he uses the gospel and the sacraments, which in the end are promises of God. So the Holy Spirit uses God's promises to make faith in us, to convince us, to, to create a new heart, uh, all these various ways that we talk about this. Um, so faith, faith comes from the Holy Spirit. And um, th then it's also saying this is not a matter of a, a law. It's not a matter of a sort of system that we can... Um, just if you input the right parts, then you're guaranteed a certain outcome. What am I talking about? Well, the Holy Spirit makes faith in those who hear the gospel where and when he wills. So the Holy Spirit is free in this. It's not like we're, we can say, uh, well, Holy Spirit, I quoted John 3.16 to that guy, so that guy has to have faith. Uh, the confession saying that's not the way that it works, that faith is a thing that freely works through the freedom of the Holy Spirit. Um, and yet, <clears throat> this does not work without means. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not just going around touching people and saying, you've got faith, you've got faith, you've got faith. Uh, he actually uses uh, the gospel and the sacraments. Um, the gospel teaches that we have a gracious God not through our merit, but through Christ's merit, when we so believe. Um, so this is what the gospel is doing. And then, of course, um, what this article is usually called uh, the office of preaching, concerning the office of preaching, um, it's claiming that God uh, instituted this. God created the office of preaching. We'll talk more about it when we get to Article 14. Um, but... Um, I'll just I'll just preview. Um, this this is talking about you know uh, the public ministry, uh, the pastor, the the ordained person, and um, we certainly don't believe that uh, pastors or ordained people are um, the only ones who preach the gospel, or that the Holy Spirit only makes faith through the words of the pastor. Um, Everyone is, is charged with this, and the Spirit makes faith uh, through any Christian speaking the gospel. Um, but this is talking about the fact that um, there needs to be an office of this. There needs to be uh, people set apart for publicly saying this. And as we go through the confession, we'll see more about proper order in the church and what God is actually doing there. Um, but that this is this is what God wants done. And we see, you know, we see this all through the Old Testament with God picking prophets 
And then, of course, Jesus himself uh, institutes it by, by sending his apostles out to baptize all nations, teaching them um, everything that he has taught. So that, that's, that's what we believe. Um, but many of these articles then have a condemnation following it. Um, ultimately, this is to provide theological clarity, um, but it's also an attempt to show the emperor and some of the other authorities who are opposed to the evangelical church that we are not, um, you know, we're not rebels. We're not trying to create um, social, uh, we're, not, we're not leading a rebellion. And so in addition to teaching what we believe, uh, specific groups are mentioned who are who are doing things that we disagree with, and also um, to say um, we're we're not. For for instance, the Anabaptists are mentioned in the in the condemnation here on the fifth article. Um, we'll get into the theology on that in just a second. Uh, but uh, the Anabaptist groups are also um, refusing to participate in the society. So at this time, you still have things like um, night watches. If you've been to Europe and seen any of the cities that still have the medieval walls around them, uh, the men in town took turns sitting on the wall through the night to make sure the town wasn't going to get attacked. Uh, and and uh, Anabaptists are refusing to do things like that. Uh, they refuse to take oaths to their... Um, medieval lords. Uh, they refuse to fight. Um, they, they're pacifists. So these are various historical factors weighing in, but of course the important thing now is to talk about the theology. So the article continues on, condemned are the Anabaptists and others who teach that we obtain the Holy Spirit without the external word of the gospel through our own preparation, thoughts, and works. So that is that is that is kind of the big dividing line. Um, Article four is the big dividing line uh, between the Catholic Church and the Lutheran Church. Um, it's as much as relations have improved between Lutherans and Catholics through the years. This is still a disagreement. Now, in 1991, there was this document uh, called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification that some uh, some Lutherans and some Catholics signed together, and they came out and they said, oh boy, the Reformation's over, we agree on everything now. Um, <laughs> it was really the Lutheran, as, as almost always happens in these ecumenical deals, it's the Lutheran surrendering. They basically uh, agreed to the Catholic position, uh, and so they were, those who signed it were attacked by various Lutherans, but then um, uh, the, the, the papacy also rejected it. They, they said, this, is, this goes too far towards the Lutheran position, so we don't really like it either. So, Anyway, for whatever it's worth, uh, Article 4, that's the disagreement. But here in Article 5 is the disagreement that Lutherans have with almost all Protestants. Um, you could leave out uh, Anglicans and uh, various types of churches that come out of England, uh, Methodism. There's all, it, you know... You're always making generalizations about these things. There's all kinds of different Methodists. There's all kinds of different Anglicans. Um, but most of them, to one extent or another, agree with this article about the Holy Spirit coming through external words. Uh, the Reformed Church, Calvinists mostly, uh, and some Swiss Reformed churches, agree with the Lutherans on this uh, to one extent or another. Um, but sort of... Uh, a popular American religion um, largely disagrees with this. Um, there's this feeling that the Holy Spirit kind of operates uh, apart from the Word of God. Um, the, the classic example of this that we have now is not the Anabaptists, but the, but the Pentecostals, that the Holy Spirit uh, comes and is able to work apart from, apart from external words. 
Where this becomes even more controversial is when this gets applied to the sacraments. How does God relate to uh, physical things in the sacraments? And we'll see that as we go through here. Questions, uh, comments? It's, uh, the, these confessions are, are always controversial. They're always trying to sort of define things. And that, that means drawing lines around things. I'm sitting over here Googling. I didn't know what Anabaptist Okay, yeah, well, okay, yeah, Anabaptist, see what, what happens is, um, you know, Luther writes these very important things in, the, in 1520, the freedom of a Christian man concerning the Babylonian captivity of a church gets excommunicated in 1521, and then right around 1524 and 25, all these new movements spring up, that say basically uh, we agree with what Luther said against the Pope, uh, but he hasn't gone far enough. So, for instance, in in Zurich, there's a uh, there's a reformer named Zwingli um, who doesn't agree with Luther on everything, and he wants to go a little farther than Luther on certain things. Um, but among those who are listening to him. Um, a couple of guys decide that uh, the baptism of infants isn't proper, doesn't, doesn't work. And so they, they, they baptize each other and they start uh, a movement uh, in Zurich. Um, Anabaptist is, is actually a slur that uh, Amish people would think. It means re-baptizer. Now, today, of course, the Amish don't rebaptize anyone. They just don't baptize you until you're a certain age. But at this time, unless you were a Jew, you were already baptized. Um, you weren't a citizen of France or the Holy Roman Empire or anything until you got baptized. That was all tied together. So they're called the rebaptizers because these people who, who, from our perspective, have already been baptized, uh, then get baptized again. Uh, they, they, they will go on to take the name Amish, uh, Mennonites are in this category, Hutterites, um, there's various other groups who uh, really flourish in the United States because they're, they're persecuted uh, in Europe. Many of the groups have to move multiple times from one country to another. Uh, when I was in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, we had services in German. My congregation was largely made up of German people who, as children, were in the Ukraine. You know, the Germans were settling in many parts of Russia throughout the 17th, 18th, 19th century. And um, so they grew up in the Ukraine. Uh, Hitler's army came through town and uh, swept up all the guys who were old enough. There was one gentleman uh, that was there in my church who had actually been in the Wehrmacht. He was old enough that when the German army came through, uh, they enlisted him. And then in January of 1945, the German army came back through and told the people, you've got about three or four hours before the Red Army is going to be here. And so they packed up all their possessions into wagons and headed for Germany where they didn't have any relatives, their, their families hadn't lived there for 100, 200 years in some cases. And uh, so after the war ended, they had no citizenship anywhere, and it was uh, generally easier to get into Canada than the United States. So that's how that group of people ended up in Vancouver. But um, we would once a month have a German language sing-along, and uh, they had a lot of friends who were German Catholics as well as Mennonites who would come for the German uh, sing-along. Many of those people had at some point in their history fled Germany and come to Uruguay in South America. And then they eventually uh, had to flee Uruguay and ended up in Canada. So, so there's a lot of interesting political history here. Uh, but in the end, theologically, uh, we don't agree with them. And that's what this article in the Augsburg Confession is saying. Your meetings locally, like with the various pastors, I can't remember what that group is made, that it's called. But do you see the differences just in the communication with them? Yeah, the Iron Mountain Area Clergy Association, I'm at it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like it and we have a good time together. And um, 
uh, this last meeting that I was at, there was actually um, there was there was some disagreement. I mean, you kind of have to just say, OK, we're all getting together. We know we don't agree on things. And not only that, right, not only that, but most of us are quite interested in these things. <laughs> you know, it's easier for someone who goes to church to know someone from another church because the topic doesn't come up so much. Uh, anyways, we get along well, and you know we work on charitable things. That's the that's the main ecumenical thing that always works well if you're if you're helping out people who need help rather than having theological arguments. However, we did go to a new church, um, which which comes out of the Pentecostal tradition, and there was actually a retired uh, Presbyterian minister. We started asking this pastor questions, and they were good natured. They had a good they had a good conversation, but it's the kind of thing we usually avoid. Otherwise, we would just spend the whole time arguing about theological topics. And uh, the Presbyterian was uh, pretty uh, liberal in his Presbyterianness because he was he was mentioning that Presbyterians talk about uh, cessationism, which is basically that they believe, and we agree with them here, you know, the Reformed and the Lutherans are pretty close on most everything, that this idea of the gift of tongues and these things, these were gifts during the apostolic age. These were, these were special gifts that happened in, in the generation after Jesus, and they've, they've come to an end. I mean, he was saying, now, as a, as a Presbyterian, I don't fully agree with that. I, I have no problem with speaking in tongues. And so they explored this a little bit. And, and, and the pastor of the Pentecostal church said, yes, it, it true. We finally believe that if you don't talk in tongues, you will not receive eternal life. That this is a sign that the Holy Spirit has come to you. And if this has never happened to you, you do not have the Holy Spirit. So that's just, you know, to get back to this, that's that's not quite what Article 5 is talking about, but it's a very similar thing. And, you know, he, the Pentecostal pastor kept apologizing, saying, I know we're not going to agree on this. And, you know, and he was welcoming us all and we all had a good time. But yes, that, I mean, the, the, these differences do persist. Sure. Sure. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, they have they have a different sort of culture of church than we have. You know, the, the building and the, and the sanctuary is quite different. Although, you know, my, my church in South Range, Michigan was amphitheater style. That's kind of becoming the new style rather than the straight church. You know, you've got an amphitheater and, um, you know, there were there were churches like that in the ancient church too. Most what we think of as the church is basically medieval is when these traditions come. So yeah, that was different, and uh, uh, there didn't happen to be any any singing at this funeral. I don't know. You know, I know how difficult it is to find uh, musicians, and <laughs> we're we're lucky to have Karen, or we'd have no music right now either. So I don't know exactly, but no, yeah. When you go into different churches, you get a you get different feelings. Um, I took a class in seminary in St. Paul uh, called Comparative Confessions, in which we learn these kind of things we're talking about now. And uh, part of the assignment for that class was you had to go to, I think, three other kinds of churches. And the professor said, if you go to St. such and such, I forget the name of it, uh, it's, a, it's great to go because you'll be entering 19th century Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> it's a German Catholic church in St. Paul. St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis has all the Scandinavian. St. Paul is German and Irish, and there's a lot of Catholic churches. And so I went to that church, and it's it's interesting. I mean, they've got the Ten Commandments in German. They've got all kinds of German all around. Uh, the priest, of course, is Irish, because for many generations, um, Ireland was supplying the vast majority of American priests because they still had the big families and, and had a lot of people going to priest. Now, of course, Ireland needs to import priests from India and other kind of places. Uh, so it was very interesting, and it was during Lent. And uh, just the liturgy around the Eucharist took 45 minutes. There was liturgy leading up to the Lord's Supper, then a 45-minute liturgy uh, around that, and then longer service after that. 
But so many of these things are historical too. Um, Lutheran services were three hours long until you know 150 years ago or so. Um, people, people at the time of the Reformation, um, there'd be an hour worth of the liturgy. Then people would show up and hear the sermon, and then they would leave. Uh, Lutherans, for the first 50 years or so, Lutherans didn't commune very often at all. In the late Middle Ages, people didn't receive Holy Communion, and and Lutherans had a hard time convincing people to do that for a long, long time. So there's cultural differences, there's theological differences. and Yeah, no, I mean, the pastor uh, preached a sermon on the Sermon on the Mount that uh, I, was, I was quite fond of. I thought it was a good sermon. But I, I noticed many things were different than our funerals. When my boys were in um, youth group, they would have a for Sunday school, they took the group. I don't can't remember who. It, I think Cindy Cullen was probably one of the leaders of Rich Group, maybe. But they took that group to different churches around town for their church service. So that was interesting for them too. Mm -hmm. We took a group to Maranatha. Yeah. Yeah. And went to Burger King and discussed it. <laughs> 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 be open and be filled. <laughs> All right, well, let's let's move on a little bit here. This is good discussion. Um, but uh, Article Six is concerning the new obedience, and and what this is is basically, uh, you know, the oldest objection to Article 4, to the doctrine of justification by faith alone, justification by grace, the oldest objection is, well, uh, you're either being lazy or you're, uh, you have some secret sins that you're hiding that you want to get away with. <laughs> and so uh, this is just basically saying, just because we have taken good works out of the process of justification, We've actually gotten rid of the process altogether and made it just a word from God that makes faith. That doesn't mean that we're saying you shouldn't be doing good works. That doesn't mean we're saying uh, anything goes. And that's what the sixth article is talking about. It is also taught that such faith should yield good fruit and good works and that a person must do such good works as God has commanded for Christ's sake, but not place trust in them as if thereby to earn grace before God. So not, not, you're not doing your good works to earn God's favor. You're not doing your good works to earn brownie points with God. For we receive forgiveness of sins and righteousness through faith in Christ, as Christ himself says. When you have done all things, say we are worthless slaves. Uh, this is the... In the 17th chapter of Luke, uh, Jesus is saying, um, you know, um, your slave doesn't get rewarded. He, he speaks very, very harshly. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no point at which you overachieve what you're supposed to do. Jesus says uh, in this passage, when the slave comes in from the field, having done all the field work, do you then say, oh, okay, come and sit at my table? No, you say... Slave, go make my supper. Then after I get my supper, you can eat. So, you know, this isn't like uh, Jesus is, is agreeing with a particular uh, form of labor or anything, but he's using the illustration from life, and he's, he's reminding us um, that, that in our relationship to God, with what God requires of us, we never, get it, we never make it into the extra credit portion. God's demand is full and complete. And uh, even if you've done everything perfectly, you should just say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we should have, is the completion of the quote in the Gospel of Luke. And so this is just a way of saying that, that uh, good works are not earning God's favor. What are good works doing? Good works are serving our neighbor. Good works are pleasing God, but they're not, they're not uh, earning us anything, especially not eternal life. Uh, the fathers also teach the same thing. So this is another theme that we'll see in the Augsburg Confession. Uh, the criticism of the evangelicals is uh, you're, you're, you're doing something new. 
the, the term Lutheran is actually initially an insult, just like the term Anabaptist. It's, it's, it's the Catholic Church saying, we are the mighty Catholic Church. We have all the traditions. We have the history. And you all just want to follow this one errant monk named Luther? You want to become Lutherans instead of Catholics? Who would want to do that? Um, and so in the Augsburg Confession, the, the evangelicals are trying to say, this is what the church has always taught. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, this is what's in Scripture, which is the final rule and norm for us. But also, the ancient church agrees, actually, with what we're saying. And so they're framing the whole thing as saying the only things we're contradicting, the only things we're getting rid of are bad traditions that have crept into the church for the last thousand years or so. That's the way they're kind of framing the history of the church in this. Uh, Ambrose, a uh, very important bishop in the ancient church, uh, the pastor of St. Augustine, uh, a man who is known for his preaching and who also uh, wrote uh, hymns that we, we still sing today. Um, the fathers also teach the same thing, for Ambrose says, it is determined by God that whoever believes in Christ shall be saved and have forgiveness of sins, not through works, but through faith alone, without merit. So that's a that's a big one. Boom. We've got Ambrose here. And of course, what is Ambrose doing? He's basically, he's paraphrasing the Apostle Paul. He's paraphrasing the Book of Romans, uh, which is what Martin Luther will do uh, 1,200 years later, is, is base his, his theology on Romans here. Uh, Romans has, has created uh, many... Uh, renewal movements, many new bursts of the preaching of the word and faith uh, throughout Christian history. And, and one way to look at the Reformation is to simply say uh, they, they started taking the book of Romans seriously again. And if, and if you do, then all these consequences fall out of it. Um, you still have a little time here. Let's, let's con continue on. Um, Another issue that they're dealing with is uh, what is the church? You know, the Pope simply can sit in Rome and say, I am the church. And he's got, you know, hundreds of years of tradition. Uh, he was he was chosen by the cardinals. So he's so maybe if maybe he's not the church, but the the Roman Curia is the church or maybe the Roman Curia and then down through all the bishops, all through the hierarchy, uh, this is the church. So even us little lay people are part of the church, but it's because, of course, we're attached to the priest who's attached to the bishop, to the archbishop, and, and so on and so forth. And so this article is going to lay out that that is not what the church is. Uh, the church is something different. I, I, I talked last week about how the smoke called articles are included in our, our book of Concord, the Confessions of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and it's in the small called articles that uh, Luther says, what I quoted in a sermon recently, uh, thank God every seven-year-old knows what the church is. It's the collection of sheep who hear the voice of their shepherd. Uh, the Augsburg Confession is going to say it a little uh, more formally than that in several ways as we go here. So we've got Article 7 concerning the church and Article 8, what is the church? Article 7, it is also taught by our churches, of course, that at all times there must be and remain one holy Christian church. Now this is something interesting right here. What do we say on Sunday mornings? We believe in the one, the one Catholic, holy Catholic church. Uh, that's, of course, a quite new thing. That's come in after the Second Vatican Council in the 60s, uh, in which the Catholic Church uh, began to move towards recognizing other kinds of churches as churches, even, even if churches that they have a lot of disagreements with. And so that kind of started, well, it didn't start it by any means, but it, it lent a lot of uh, impetus to the the ecumenical movement, which was kind of at its strongest in the late 20th century. And uh, so uh, Lutherans, we know that the original 
Apostles' Creed, it, it's tough to say exactly when the original Apostles' Creed is. By the second century, most of it has been assembled. Uh, the form that we actually use on Sunday isn't around till the fourth century, until uh, after the, the Nicene Creed actually is created in 325. Uh, and it kind of arises simultaneously in the Greek church and the Latin Western church. And the, and the word there is Catholic in the original uh, uh, Apostles' Creed. So we're being sort of historically accurate. Now, uh, a lot of people think that it was Martin Luther who got rid of the word Catholic and translated it as Christian. Uh, that's not true. Uh, actually, in Germany, and, and I'm not quite sure about this, but probably in other Germanic language countries, be long before the Reformation, they had started saying the Christian church. And no one knows exactly why, other than that um, many people think that Catholic is just kind of a, a strange word in Germanic languages. It comes, of course, uh, from Greek and Latin. And um, so... Uh, the feeling in all cases, whether it was before the Reformation or Luther or today, the feeling is that Catholic and Christian finally mean the same thing. So we, we say Catholic with a small c. We're not saying we believe in the, in the Roman hierarchy as the one and only true church, but we are saying that there is one and only true church that's made of all people who trust in Christ. Where does the word Catholic come from? It comes from controversies in the early church, in which it was used in much the same way as the Reformation, um, in which uh, heretics would attack one tenet of the faith, and eventually this church started saying, we're the Catholic church, we're the one who believes in the totality of the Christian faith. We're the ones who believe in the Holy Trinity, in Christ's divinity, in Christ's humanity, um, and so we believe in the totality of everything, and that's where the word Catholic comes from. So we believe there is one church. Uh, it's, not just, uh, it's not just our Savior's Lutheran church. It's not just the North American Lutheran church. It's not just the Lutheran church. It's all who uh, trust in Christ. That's what we're confessing when we confess that. And that's what the Augsburg Confession is confessing. Okay, so there will always be one holy Catholic church, and then here's the definition. It is the assembly of all believers among whom the gospel is purely preached and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. Um, so it's not a hierarchy. Uh, it's not even a, a feeling that I have. It's not my personal thing. Um, it's the place where the word and the sacraments are. So it's a beautiful, short definition. Uh, it's a sort of beautifully ecumenically minded thing. But of course, there's going to be a lot to come here that's going to be defining um, how the gospel is purely preached and how the sacraments are administered according to the gospel, according to the biblical uh, institution. And there, there's lots of controversy. So it's kind of a double-edged sword here. Uh, for this is enough for the true unity of the Christian church that the, there the gospel is preached harmoniously according to a pure understanding and the sacraments are administered in conformity with the divine word. So that's kind of a repeat of what the first paragraph has said there. Uh, and now here's the big one. It is not necessary for the true unity of the Christian church that uniform ceremonies instituted by human beings be observed everywhere. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Uh, so why, why the mention of ceremonies? Uh, well, uh, the evangelicals are objecting to certain things that happen in worship, most, in, most of all, the idea that the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice, that the priest is sacrificing Jesus to God. And so that means that there are, are changes to the liturgy um, from the evangelical churches, changes from the late medieval uh, liturgies. Uh, but included with that ceremony, they're also talking about basically the, the entire hierarchy. They're talking about all, all traditions made by human beings. 
so this is a disagreement between the Lutheran and Church and the Catholic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church rather indirectly basically thinks that Jesus uh, established the papacy, uh, whereas we say, well, uh, that's clearly not in Scripture. There's no, there's no mention of that at all. Um, but um, other, the, the, and this is where the Scripture principle comes in, because until this time, the Church basically understands, you know, the, the Church is a big fan of the Bible. The, the Catholic Church is not against the Bible. Uh, but they also think that there's this other oral tradition that didn't get recorded in Scripture. And that's um, where, you know, it, it was given to the apostles, and they have handed it on orally to the bishops down through the ages. And, and the evangelicals come in and say, no, 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 no. We're sticking with what is written in, in Scripture alone. And uh, they're also observing things. They're observing that the churches in the East don't worship quite the same way that the churches in the West do. So does that mean that there's, there's no Christians in Asia Minor, there's no Christians in Russia, there's no Christians in all the Eastern church in North Africa, there's no Christians there. Uh, and all these churches, of course, openly state that they don't uh, give authority to the Pope. Uh, and so the, the Lutheran Church is relying on these some of these historical realities. Another thing is that um, at the beginning of the Reformation, Martin Luther calls for a free council. In the centuries leading up to the Protestant Reformation, um, there's been a conciliar movement in which people within the, the church, just, you know, Luther was within the church and didn't want to leave until he was kicked out. But people within the church say, no, the council is the ultimate authority in the church, not the not the not the pope, and so there's arguments between the popes and the councils for this. In years, at one point in the 14th century, there's three different popes because there's disagreements about this. Um, then, the conciliar movement is kind of finally put to death at the Council of Constance, where John Huss is burned at the stake for for believing that all Christians should receive. Uh, both the body and the blood of Christ. And so the Pope is asserting his authority there. Well, now, uh, drawing on that recent tradition, Luther says we need a, we need a council to figure this out. Uh, although eventually he will say, finally, the ultimate authority in the church is not the Pope or the council, it is scripture. But he still thinks the council might be an effective way of getting the church back to scripture. Uh, eventually, in the late 1530s, there's talk about a council, wars interrupted from happening. Eventually, the Council of Trent meets in 1545, which is the year uh, before Luther dies, and the Lutherans refuse to attend it because they can see that it's, it's, it's rigged, to use one of our words. They see that their position is not going to be given a fair hearing, and they think if they glow, they'll just be lending some authority to this council that's going to uh, rule against them on everything. Um, but it's not until this Council of Trent that Catholic practice really becomes uniform. Um, before the Council of Trent, uh, each local bishop was ultimately responsible for how the Mass happened in their local area. So you have tremendously uh, different Masses in France, in Spain, in England, these things are are much more nationally determined. The, the Catholic Church's uh, idea is that they're sort of above uh, nationhood. You know, there it's a it's a Catholic Church that's got people from all over the world, and you know, there's some truth to that. Um, but it's also very true that uh, Catholicism takes national forms based on culture. Uh, just like all other churches do. So anyway, that, that's that's way too much information. But it's 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 behind what the Augsburg Confession is rejecting. It's saying all we have to do is have the Word and the sacraments and believe what we hear. That is the church. And uh, you know, even there's there's of course Christians among Catholics too. This is not saying uh, you guys are all uh, anathema. It's saying that this is what the church actually is, and we want to teach you that. Okay.
uh, we'll pick it up not next week. Uh, Jeff White is doing our worship service next week, but uh, Sunday after that, we'll pick it up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would keep us on the narrow way. We ask that you would give us love and patience for all people, but that you would give us faith that surrenders nothing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.